UCLA ends the history of Pac-12 football by stepping on a rake. LAFC heads to Seattle for the playoffs and nasty coffee. And LeBron James opens up a museum to himself. Good morning. I'm James. This is your daily dose of sports and snark for the greatest sports scene in the world, Los Angeles. This is the Faithful Angelino's Morning Report. So it is November 26, 2023. It is also Sunday, the Lord's Day. Take a moment. Thank God for the blessings that you have in your life. It was a tough month for me, but even I can find reasons to be blessed and happy. So one of those reasons, of course, LA Sports. If you like being in the know about LA, click and clack the like button. Click and clack the subscribe button. There's a notification bell. Hit that. It'll let you know we drop new content. Sharing is caring. Let people know we exist. And by all means, comment because I like hearing from you guys. And I try to reach back. Before we go through the news notes, a look at the scoreboard. Ethan Garbers got injured super early in the game. And as a result, frankly, UCLA just didn't have a prayer. California came to play 33-7 over the Bruins. Dante Moore did throw for 266 yards. But he also threw two interceptions, and UCLA committed four turnovers. Anthony Davis scored 32 points and 13 rebounds as the Lakers defeated Cleveland to 121-115. The Clippers have won four of their last five. Paul George scored 25 points, Clippers 107, Dallas 88, and Trevor Moore scored twice. The Kings are in second place in the Pacific Division, by the way, after a 4 to nothing victory over Montreal. Phoenix Copley struggled early in the season, but he got the shutout win. Meanwhile, today, the Rams are at Arizona today at 1. Kyron Williams has been activated off of injured reserve. He is referring to himself as 150%. Statistically impossible, but we get the drift. Baltimore will be playing at the Chargers at 5.30 tonight. You know, um, over the last 12 games, and that includes the play playoff loss in Jacksonville, the Bolts are just 4-8 and eight each. And by the way, LAFC is playing at Seattle at 6.30 in MLS Cup playoffs tonight. We'll be talking a little bit more about that in a couple of moments. But... Got to start off by talking about UCLA because that game, if you paid money to see that game, you may as well have just headed for the exits the moment that Ethan Garbers got blown up in the first quarter. Straight up. Moore came out one second later, first play of the game for him, throws a pick right in the end zone. And I got to tell you something. Overall, with UCLA, and I'm probably telling you something that you already know, right? Let's take a half step back. Through the course of the year, the two things we learned about UCLA football, they D up like hell. Absolutely. And then, frankly, this whole concept of Chip Kelly saying, oh, we have three people that we know can play quarterback for us. Absolute lie. We called it out before the season. If you have two quarterbacks... You really have no quarterbacks. UCLA claiming they had three quarterbacks? Oh, no. The only person who could even hang out there was Ethan Garbers. The margin of error is that minimal for UCLA. And by the way, we still don't know the extent of Garbers' injury. We know it is his right shoulder. And by the way, that's why I wasn't so hype about making a prediction prior to the USC game. We didn't know if Garbers was playing until the morning of the game. So that's how slim the margin of error was. Garbers may not be amazing, but he's steady as she goes. And that gave UCLA the best chance to win. So yeah, Dante Moore, I'm not saying he's terrifyingly bad. I'm not saying he'll never have a decent career. People were talking all kinds of trash about Dorian Thompson Robinson. And yes, last night he threw a TD pass as well. But even after he threw the TD pass to put the Bruins ahead by a point for about a half a minute, the ensuing kickoff got returned for a touchdown and Cal never looked back. Now, I will say, does that make the now returning calls for Chip Kelly to be fired, does that make it fair? Because I was reading those calls online. 
One week after blasting USC right in the teeth, the call to fire Chip Kelly is coming up right all over again. Now, Kelly, if you do want him to be fired, I understand. Never said I'm trying to defend the guy. He's 34 and 34 at, as the coach of UCLA. And oh, by the way, this year they didn't even play Oregon. They didn't play Washington. USC did that. USC gave Washington a game. But the Bruins finished the season 7-5, and five, just like USC. And they're under 500 in conference. So there's really not strategically to talk about with that game in terms of X's and O'ing. The moment Ethan Garbers got hurt, that game was done. And, by, and since we don't know the extent of the injury, that does not argue positivity for the bowl game either. I have one more topic about the game, though, uh, on a different matter. ESPN, spare me your crocodile tears about that being the last Pac-12 conference game. Spare it. Spare me. Because that game was Pac-12 after dark, which, by the way, was one of the main reasons the Pac-12 conference pretty much no longer exists, right? It went from Pac-12 to Pac-2 in the span of a year for a reason. And that reason is Pac-12 after dark. If you want to know why UCLA no longer has a deep roster, it's because it's really difficult to recruit when your games last way after midnight on the East Coast. Is it Chip Kelly or is it Pac-12 after dark? UCLA Athletics, tens of millions of dollars in debt. You want to know why UCLA has a significant amount of trouble getting out of debt? Does anybody think Pac-12 after dark, the TV revenue from that, is going to save that program? Absolutely not. Meanwhile, did you ever notice that the top teams in the conference, you never saw Pac-12 after dark in Washington. You never saw Pac-12 after dark in Oregon. And that is because ESPN wanted USC, wanted UCLA, to the detriment of both of those schools, hence them leaving to the Big Ten. So spare me. The Pac-12 was pretty good at football this year. They're definitely great at hoops. And they were mismanaged right into the ground because ESPN convinced Pac-12 leaders about stupid ideas like Pac-12 after dark. Don't blame the schools. Blame yourself. Pac-12, ESPN. So, look, I get it. LA's soccer fan base has been divided. But either way, even if you hate LAFC, tonight's game, in my opinion, is going to be must-watch. And I don't really feel comfortable making a prediction per se. I acknowledge I am a Galaxy fan, and that would be seen through gold and blue colored glasses, right? But there's a lot of reasons to believe that Seattle can win this game. First of all, it is up in Seattle, that is definitely something that the Sounders have going for it. The Sounders are unbeaten in regular time in 19 consecutive playoff matches. 17 of them were outright wins. And I'm assuming that the other two were ties because of home and home back in the day. The other reason, Seattle just absolutely excels in possessing the, foot, in possessing the ball. They're among the 10 players, the 10 players that have control of the ball more than anybody else in MLS Cup playoffs, four of them play for Seattle. Four of them play for the Sounders. So what LAFC has to do to win, in my opinion, is pretty damn obvious. Counterattack. Definitely strike for those few moments that you do have the ball. And by the way, whatever you do when you have the ball, you've got to locate 99. Dennis Bowanga because he has just been absolutely on fire all year long and definitely has been turning it up in that first round series against Vancouver. So can LAFC win? Yeah, that is the formula, simplistic as it sounds. Well, I just wouldn't put a lot of money on it. Yesterday was huge for LeBron James. I mean, he did grow up in Cleveland area after all, the Ohio kid that makes good. It was a huge day 
for his ego. <laughs> I mean, I like LeBron James. We all pretty much like LeBron James, but let's be real. That dude's got an ego. The Cavs honored him before the game uh, for becoming the NBA's all-time leading scorer. Absolutely cool. Definitely classy of them. Totally makes sense to me. But there's now a LeBron James museum. The man built a museum to himself in Akron, stacked with keepsakes from high school all the way through his pro career. Does it in fact have autographed clips of Space Jam 2? No idea, but it definitely has mementos from high school all the way up to his career. And by the way, here's what happens. You go there and you begin the tour by pulling a string to Unit 602, which is how he has to, had to enter his apartment back when he was a kid, which is touching. And I get it. It is a rags to riches story. And people like those sort of things. Dude, really? A museum to yourself. There are only pretty much two types of people who build museums to themselves. Presidents and LeBron James. And even presidents try to fudge the numbers by calling it a presidential library instead of a museum. Not even all living presidents build themselves museums, by the way. We still, nobody is clamoring for a Donald Trump mu museum. Have you heard word one about a Donald Trump museum? I don't even know what the hell they would put in a Donald Trump museum other than, I don't know, spray tan, photos of Kim Jong-un and stolen government documents. Other than that, what would you put in a Donald Trump museum? I'm sure there's plenty of things, but spray tan and stolen government documents pretty much top the list. <laughs> Let's be real. And LeBron James has a museum. LeBron James. Dude, we love what you did in 2020, but you're not exactly Martin Luther King. You're not Rosa Parks. Do you really think you need a museum? Thanks for getting us the title in 2020. One draft choice after the Chargers took Quentin Johnston this year. Baltimore selected Zay Flowers. Another wide receiver. Johnston, 20 catches. His best game was against Chicago. Five catches, 50 yards. Flowers is part of the reasons that Baltimore has one of the most explosive offenses in the NFL. Flowers has 53 catches for 583 yards. Most catches by a rookie in Ravens history. Now, Johnston is going to hear about that tonight. He probably already has heard about it. For Pete's sake, he's already been hearing about how he's not contributing enough to the Chargers. He's not that stupid. He's not telling people to back off. He's saying he's hearing it. He said he's guilty of playing hesitantly at the beginning of the year. Quote, I didn't want it to be like this. I didn't want to start this slow, but I can't fix what's ahead of me. That's all I focus on, unquote. That's what he told ESPN. Well, this would be a pretty good night to get started, dude. Especially after that drop in Green Bay. Just saying. Do the LA Kings have the deepest group of forwards in the NHL? Now, nobody is putting up insane numbers. Nobody is going Connor McDavid out there. But they all succeed it's not like the Oilers where you have two super duper lines and two lines where you're like, time to go to the bathroom, right? For example, Andre Kopitar, every king is contributing in the forwards, in the forward group. Andre Kopitar, 10 goals. Adrian Kempe, 40 plus last year in terms of goals. Now he's just adding points. Goals and assists, goals and assists. He has 20 points to lead the team. And Quinton Byfield, we talked about him a couple of days ago. How all of a sudden, he's a point-a-game guy. They've had 21 games. He's, he's put up like 18 points. Anaheim coach Greg Cronin is noticing. He told The Athletic that the Kings are, quote, a handful. They're a Stanley Cup contending team. So keep that in mind. The Kings might actually be Stanley Cup contenders again. But you let me know what you think of the comments thread. 
Talk to me about the state of UCLA football after that face plant last night. Who you got, LAFC or Seattle tonight? And if you enjoy the content, don't forget to subscribe to Faithful Angelinos. We're talking LA sports every single day here. Thank you for watching. I'm James. We'll be back tomorrow. Faithful Angelinos is a Kian Corte El Queso production. Take care.